Welcome to ChemVid number two, colligative properties. So if you recall from last time, we did molarity, molality, and parts per million. Molarity is used for dilutions and solutions. That's what we did in the Kool-Aid lab. And molality is used for, ta-da, colligative properties. So pretty. Okay, so colligative properties. Let's start this thing. Okay, colligative properties are physical properties that only depend on concentration. All right, so physical properties is boiling point. You can have color. You can have, you know, any of those physical properties we talked about. Colligative properties um, is just a bit narrower. It has only to do with concentration. So it's when you're making a solution or changing the concentration of a solution. Those are the properties we're talking about. All right, so only on concentration. Um, let's see. Osmotic pressure is pressure caused when it's okay. Sorry, start over. Osmotic pressure is a one of the colligative properties. All right. So osmotic pressure is when water molecules move in or out of a solution, and the reason why it is a colligative property is if you look at the diagram, you can see that we have a high concentration of molecules over here, sugar molecules. We have a low concentration over here. And then we have a membrane in between that lets some of the molecules through and some of them not. Okay. And the sugar molecules are too big to move through it, so the water molecules are the ones that are moving. And that pressure that we're talking about is the pressure to go through that membrane. So the molecules are, are literally pushing their way through the membrane, and that's what we call osmotic pressure. So um, just like you learned in biology class, when you have something with a high concentration and a low concentration, we like equilibrium. Everything likes equilibrium. So the water starts to flow over to the high concentration and is trying to make sure that both sides have the same concentration. One's not high, one's not low. They're trying to equal out. All right, and that's why water moves through the membrane. So osmotic pressure is a colligative property. It depends on concentration. The next thing is vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is pressure caused when liquid particles have escaped the surface of the liquid and entered the gaseous state. You may recognize this as um, vaporization. Vaporization is when you boil water and it goes into a gas, right? Boil a liquid and it goes into a gas. Well, that pressure that it has to overcome in order to become a, ga a gas is called vapor pressure. So when you heat up the molecules, they now have enough energy to exit the liquid state into the gaseous state, and they can overcome that pressure that's holding them down. If, all right? So that's what vapor pressure is. Now, how is vapor pressure a colligative property? Well, let's take a look, and you might want to draw down this diagram because it's a very good one to know. But if you look at A, these solvent molecules, I'm going to call them water, but it can be any solvent. These water molecules are going in and out of gaseous and liquid. All right, you know that liquids tend to, they have intermolecular forces. And once you overcome that intermolecular force, you go into the gaseous phase. And once you, um, if they're too close together, they'll come back into the liquid phase. They'll condense, you know, if they don't have enough heat energy. But um, they just go in and out like normal. But if we put in a solute, um, a non-volatile solute, now before we go on, anybody know what non-volatile means? Non-volatile means that they don't evaporate. Okay, so whatever you have in there is not going to turn into the gaseous phase. We usually think of these as ionic compounds like um, salt, which is, yes, you guessed it, any metal or non-metal compound. A salt is an ionic bond. <clears throat> and um, they, remember, they dissociate into our liquid, but once the liquid's gone, they come back together into their solid form. They don't turn into a gas. So that's what we mean by non-volatile. These guys don't turn into gases. So they're not going to evaporate like water does, but instead they just get in the way of the water trying to evaporate. So if you look, you have water molecules that are trying to get out into the atmosphere. But these solutes, these non-volatile solutes, are blocking them. They can't get out. And so if they can't get out, 
then um, they have, okay, so if they can't get out, they get stuck as a liquid, and it takes much longer for them to evaporate because they have to get actually more energy than they would originally, like in this guy. They have to get more energy so they can get around those solutes and get out. All right, so vapor pressure is also based on concentration of your solute. All right, so question is, what will adding a non-volatile solute do to a pure sol uh, solvent? Well, it does this. They block the molecules from evaporating. It slows down evaporation. It slows down boiling point. It messes with your melting point. It messes with anything where you're talking about your molecules shifting from one energy level to another energy level. So any phase change is going to be affected by that. <clears throat> All right, concentration. Concentration is what we learned of before with molarity and molality. Those are ways we measure concentration. But just so you know, concentration is just how much solute there is in a solvent. So a high concentration means there's a lot of solute. Um, Low concentration means there's a little bit of solute per solvent ratio, all right? All right, so over here, we have draw two models, one of a pure solvent with vapor particles escaping, and one of a solvent uh, solution with vapor particles exp exp escaping, and why does a dissolved solute reduce vapor pressure? So that's what I explained here. This is my picture, okay? And I drew the particles, and now I have two particles, and they're escaping. And then I explained it to you. I want you to do that on your own right here. All right, so you draw your own picture, and you can do that right there. All right? All right, so you can come back to that, or you can pause the video and do that. Next, how does molality relate to boiling point and melting point? Well, let's take a look at this guy right here. Like I said before, boiling point is when the liquid has enough energy to escape the vapor pressure and go into the atmospheric pressure, correct? So, if my bubbles can, if my gas that's formed down here has enough energy, it comes out. Evaporation is just when those intermolecular forces break and they're able to, the molecules are able to escape, okay? So, Molality deals with concentration. It's how much solute is in your solvent. So how do you think a solute will affect the boiling point? Okay, so boiling point, if I have that solute in there, it actually causes uh, my water molecules to not be able to escape as fast. So that means that the boiling point is actually going to increase. All right, you're going to have to give these guys more energy in order to overcome the solute. So the more concentration, the higher the molality you have, the higher the boiling point. Now melting point is the opposite. So melting point is saying all of these guys with lots of energy are going to have to come together and form those lattice structures. You know, like um, ice will form crystal lattice structures. And if they're trying to come together, but there's a molecule in their way, well, it makes it very difficult for them to freeze. So what does that do to your freezing point? It lowers it. It takes, you have to get it colder in order to freeze it, which means my melting point will be higher because it's easier to melt or get those liquid molecules out of the way because they want to get rid of those solutes. They want to get away from them. So boiling point increases, melting point increases, freezing point decreases with molality with increased molality all right is boiling point elevation directly or indirectly related to molality I want you guys to answer that okay so what we've discussed up here I want you to tell me if that's indirectly or directly related all right let's move on to how we calculate this all right so now you know what a colligative property is and now we are going to do some calculations so what causes a liquid to boil? We went over this before. If you need a review, rewind the video. How does a non-volatile solute affect boiling point? Again, we've done this. If you can't remember, go back and watch the video again. Why do I add salt to my water when I make pasta? OK, 
Can you guys tell me that? Lots of people add salt to their water before they make pasta in order to do something. Try to figure this one out by yourself. All right, I want you to think about this one and come up with a good solution as to why. Be careful of what you read on the internet because they usually get this one wrong. All right. All right. So first we need to define some variables. Delta TF, you know that's change in uh, temperature, but this is more specific. It's change in freezing temperature. KF is a constant. Change in boiling point, all right? Change in boiling elevation. KB is a constant. Molality. And I is the number of dissociated ions. So, um, actually, I want to leave that up. So here we go. I, mark one over There we go. Sorry about that. I is the number of dissociated ions. So if I'm talking about NaCl, NaCl, you put it into water and it's going to split up into Na plus Cl minus. So the I is 2. Let's say I did sodium sulfate. How many ions does that break up into? Well, it breaks up into one sulfate and two sodium. So the I is 3. All right, now let's talk about, I don't know, a covalent compound, C6, H12, O6. How many pieces does this break up into? So it could break up into um, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, right? No, remember, sugar does not dissociate. Sugar doesn't break apart when you put it in water. No covalent compounds, too. So for every covalent compound, your I will always be 1. 1, 1, 1. All right. So ionic compounds can have different amounts. Covalent will always be the same. All right. So if I'm looking over here, the molal boiling point elevation constant, uh, Kb, is the difference um, in boiling point between a 1 molar um or one molal, sorry, non-electrolyte solution and the pure solvent. So the formula is, the formula is delta Tb is equal to Kb Mi. So the change in your boiling point elevation is equal to a constant, the boiling constant, which they will give to you, uh, molality of your solution, and how many ions are dissociated into it, or how many pieces there are. Okay, so I was what we were talking about up here, molality, KB they give to you, and change in temperature is what you want to know. So let's look at our delta TB is equal to KBMI number one. I look and if I read, it tells me that the boiling point constant is 0.512. It says that the molality of my solution is 0 0.029 molal. So in order to find my change in boiling point, I need to put in my KB my molality, and then they say that it's salt water, and salt is the generic term for NaCl, so I know that my I is 2, put that in there, I get 0 0.0296 degrees Celsius, or with proper sig figs, 0 0.030. Remember, I is a number of dissociated ions, so it's a perfect number. You're saying you have two dissociated ions, you can never have like two and a half. So this is a perfect number. So we go off of my molality, which is the one that I measured. So now that I have this, this means that my new boiling point for water will be 100.030 degrees Celsius. All right, that's what that number means. So let's go on to freezing point depression. Freezing point depression is very similar to boiling point depression. So here's your equation right over here, da, 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 right there. I want you to answer these questions, the formula and the example question before class, and we'll do questions one through five below in class. All right, thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something.